My name is Robert Collagen. I'm the block leader for Block 5. And the title of this talk is Intra-Abdominal Infection. While the focus of this presentation is intra-abdominal infection, it's really more important to recognize the differential diagnosis of abdominal pain. In this discussion, we will break down abdominal pain according to presentation as right upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, left upper quadrant, left lower quadrant, epigastric, suprapubic, and generalized. And highlight those which are caused by infectious, but also recognize those that are non-infectious in etiology. I refer you to the book entitled Cope's Early Diagnosis of the Acute Abdomen Revised by William Silen. Anyone going into surgery, this is mandatory reading. So starting up with right upper quadrant pain, we think about acute cholecystitis and cholangitis and liver abscesses. Diseases involving the lung, pleuridinia, and pneumonia also may present with right upper quadrant pain. Acute cholecystitis and cholangitis both present with colicky right upper quadrant pain. In the case of cholecystitis, there is often nausea, vomiting, belching, and positive Murphy's sign where you press underneath the ribs and ask the patient to breathe in, at which time the gallbladder descends onto the fingers and causes pain. Cholangitis, on the other hand, is characterized by the triad of fever, right upper quadrant pain, and jaundice. That's called Charcot's triad and is a sign of biliary sepsis. Occurs in the context of biliary stenosis or stent or instrumentation of the gallbladder. In both cases, the microbiology is similar with Enterobacteriaceae predominant, but also Enterococcus, Strep viridans from the mouth, anaerobes such as Bacteroides and Clostridium, and Fusobacterium, and occasionally Candida albicans, all of which are prevalent in the upper GI tract. The treatment for cholecystitis is usually antibiotics plus or minus surgery, and we usually rely on a beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combination with ampsalbactam or piptazole. Penicillin allergic patients may be treated with carbipenem or fluoroquinolone plus metronidazole. Liver abscesses develop in many different ways. They can extend contiguously from the gallbladder or from the biliary tree. They also may develop from portal vein circulation with a proximal intra-abdominal infection, such as appendicitis or diverticulitis, where bacteria are filtered through the portal vein into the liver and set up an abscess. Rarely they can see directly from the bloodstream, from the arterial bloodstream, and that would be associated with specific pathogens such as streptococcus and occasionally staph aureus. Penetrating in Injury will also predispose to a liver abscess from trauma and then occult causes for which the mechanism is not known. The pathogens of liver abscess depend on the source from which they arise. If it's extending from the gallbladder, it's the same microbiology as was described for gallbladder and cholangitis. For occult cryptogenic actinomyces, which occurs usually from the mouth, but seeds via the bloodstream somehow into the liver, or Streptococcus intermedius constellatus also occurring as a cryptogenic liver abscess. People traveling to areas where E. histolytica is prevalent, mainly Latin America, can get a liver abscess due to this pathogen. It results from ingestion of the parasite, but usually it does not associate with the other characteristic manifestation of E. histolytica, which is colitis. So there is a silent infection that seeds the liver leading to a liver abscess. Those who get colitis due to E. histolytica usually, surprisingly, do not get liver abscess. And colitis from E. histolytica is usually a bloody diarrhea. Exposure to dogs especially is associated with echinococcus, liver abscesses, and that is distributed throughout the world, including Latin America, in the Middle East and Africa. So one must consider these possibilities based on the appearance of the abscess. Treatment is usually with, again, a beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor when considering treatment for the usual liver abscess. Metronidazole is the drug of choice for E. histolytica, 
liver abscesses, and echinococcus liver abscesses must be recognized with serology and have characteristic septate formations that may tip off the clinician. Pleuridinia is an interesting infection caused by Coxsackie, which presents with pleuritic pain, oftentimes present radiating to the right upper quadrant. Interestingly, although it seems to involve the pleura, there is no pleural effusion. Remember that pneumonia can have referred pain to the right or left upper quadrant, and one must consider this in a person presenting with abdominal pain. Moving to right lower quadrant, the classic infectious surgical process is appendicitis, which begins with epigastric pain, radiating then finally to the right lower quadrant with focal peritonitis over the right lower quadrant leading to generalized peritonitis if not recognized. The bacteriology of appendicitis is usually that reflecting the lower intestinal tract with enterobacteriaceae, enterococcus, strep viridans, bacteroides, clostridium, and the importance of fusobacterium is increasingly recognized as a potential common thread with many appendicitises. There has been a paradigm shift in the treatment of appendicitis where originally it was is recognized to be a surgical disease first and foremost, but has now been observed to respond to antibiotics in some cases, in many cases. That is when the, in the absence of a fecal lift or an abscess or perforation by CT scan. Antibiotics may be considered and about 25% will require surgery nevertheless. Treatment with a beta-lactam beta-lactamase inhibitor is the drug of choice, but in penicillin allergic, you can use a carbipenem, fluoroquinolone, or metronidazole. The other major intra-abdominal infection is diverticulitis, which will typically present in either the right lower quadrant or the left lower quadrant, while left lower quadrant pain is more common. Fever and pain are the typical presentation often associated with defecation or change in bowel habits. The microbiology is the same as with appendicitis and as is the antibiotic treatment. One should consider pelvic infections in women with abdominal pain involving either the right or left lower quadrant, specifically salpingitis or tubo-ovarian abscesses. This is often recognized when the individual elicits history with a new sexual partner. The, the pain is usually in the lower quadrants with fever or peritonitis. In addition to enterobacteriaceae and anaerobic organisms, including bacteroides and fusobacterium, one also must consider sexually transmitted infections such as gonococcus and chlamydia. Women who have IUD in place may be susceptible to actinomyces infections, which should be considered. Finally, tuberculosis is a notorious cause of chronic pelvic infection and should be considered. The treatment of pelvic inflammatory disease presenting as salpingitis and tubor ovarian abscess should focus on sexually transmitted pathogens such as gonorrhea or the mixed infections as were highlighted. So the microbiology of salpingitis and tubo ovarian abscess includes the same pathogens as seen in the lower intestinal tract, but in addition, one should consider sexually transmitted pathogens such as gonorrhea and chlamydia or mycoplasma genitalum. The treatment of salpingitis or tubo ovarian abscess is basically defined by the presence or absence of GC, which could be established by direct probes of sampled material, either in the cervix or a percutaneous aspirate of the abscess, in which case ceftriaxone plus doxycycline would be the drug of choice. In the absence of gonorrhea, cefoxitin or cefotitin is usually effective in treating such infections. One should also consider non-infectious causes of lower quadrant pain in women, including ectopic pregnancies, ruptured ovarian cysts, endometriomas, twisted ovarian pedicles, or uterine fibroids. Left upper quadrant pain includes pleuridinia and referred pain from pneumonia and occasional splenic abscesses, which are generally rare, occur in the context of bacteremia, endocarditis, typically in an individual with injection drug use, 
or trauma. Because of the involvement by the spleen with sickle cell disease, splenic abscesses are also possible in this host. Signs and symptoms of splenic abscess include pleuritic left upper quadrant pain that may be referred to the shoulder. Microbiology includes staph, strep, but uniquely salmonella seems to be a more common pathogen with splenic infections and occasionally candidiasis can seed to the spleen. Treatment is organ specific and may require splenectomy. As with right lower quadrant pain, left lower quadrant pain has a similar differential diagnosis where diverticulitis tends to present in the left lower quadrant more commonly than the right. As was mentioned, salpingitis and tubal ovarian abscesses similarly represent on either side and the non-infectious pelvic causes in women, including ectopic pregnancy and ovarian cysts, should be considered.